Hi, welcome to the Wald Culture Podcast. I'm Carlin Lillington, and our Wald Culture guest today is Prof Professor Lawrence Lessig. Welcome to Wald Culture, Professor. Thank you for um, having me. <laughs> Professor Lessig is the Roy L. Furman Professor of Law and Leadership at Harvard Law School. And prior to returning to Harvard, he taught at Stanford Law School, where he founded the Center for Internet and Society, and he taught at the University of Chicago. He's the founder of Equal Citizens and a founding board member of Creative Commons and serves on the scientific board of AXA Research Fund. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society, and no surprise, has also been the recipient of many, rewards, many awards over his long career. The New Yorker has called him the most important thinker on intellectual property in the internet era. And in recent years, he's become a prominent activist for political and institutional reform. I first met and, inter and interviewed Larry in 2001 when the problems with analog era copyright laws and their encroachment on digital culture were becoming increasingly apparent, in large part due to his own forceful writings, speeches, and campaigning. I'm delighted to have the opportunity today to dive back into these critical subjects again with you. And I, I, I have to start by asking you how and why did you first become so passionate about these issues of copyright and the impact, both immediate and then you were always also thinking ahead um, on digital culture. And I, I note you started with business oriented degrees and economics and then management. And I was wondering, does some of that background lie behind that intellectual property interest? I don't know if it does. Um, maybe that's a question for my shrink or something like that. I mean, what I, what I remember leading to um, this focus was, first of all, recognizing the way in which the architecture of the internet or what we used to call cyberspace was really uh, a tech technology for embedding certain social or political or legal values. Um, and that it embedded some values and it resisted others. And, you know, the original architecture of the internet defended many values that, um, you know, liberal Democrats would be happy to defend. So, for example, it defended free speech because anybody could be speaking. It defended privacy because you couldn't really track anybody or see who they were given the stateless character of the original internet protocols. It defended free innovation because basically anybody who had an idea could post it on the web, and if other people liked it, they got to use it, um, even if that idea defeated the business model of the network owner. So when the first internet protocol telephone systems began to be offered. Um, everybody was able to adopt them because the platform itself had no ability to block adopting them. So these features were features embedded in the architecture. And when I began to think about the, um, the consequence in the context of intellectual, what's called intellectual property, it became clear to me that the, that the architecture um, originally made it very hard to defend the property interest in intellectual property, but that that architecture would be changed. And as it was changed, my fear was that certain values Im embedded in intellectual property, like the value of fair use or limited protection or limited uh, time during which the copyrighted work would be protected, could be overridden by the evolving technologies that would enable the purported owner to control the copyright. So this was a struggle about which values the internet should be sustaining, those of perfect control or those of access to creative works. And, and we were trying to build an architecture that would preserve access to these creative works. Can you give us a, a bit of a whirlwind tour, perhaps, of some of the ways in which copyright walls in culture? And I know there's there's so many ways, but across your books and in your many talks, you you touch on some of these quite forcefully. Well, I mean, I think one really clear example that suggests all of them is to think about film. Um, you know, so when when a when a um, producer or director makes a film, 
that film will embed lots of creative work in the context of making the film. It might have music, might have images, might have um, excerpts from um, interviews. Uh, and all of those things get wrapped together to produce the film. And when the film is originally released, what the um, what the filmmaker has done is he's cleared the rights to use the material that's inside the film, at least for the purpose of its initial distribution, initial um, um, uh, access. But over time, those rights might expire. And if you want to get access to that work and share it or make a digital version of that work or even just view it, um, in theory, you've got to go back and you've got to secure the rights to be able to do that. Um, so there was a very famous example of a documentary called Eyes on the Prize, which was a documentary about the civil rights movement. And that documentary was filled with clips from CBS News or every other um, source material that might help tell the story of the rise of the civil rights movement in the 20th century. And when they decided they wanted to re-release that film in a digital form, given the updated technologies of the internet and um, digital uh, production, it was extraordinarily difficult and expensive to go back and to be able to clear the rights for all of the elements that were in that original film. Now, you know, when copyright was originally crafted to fit the idea of a film, nobody was ever thinking about how are you going to get access to the rights to use it 50 years down the road or 100 years down the road. Um, and now that copyright can easily extend into 100 years down the road, um, it creates all of these, what we think of as orphaned create, uh, works. Um, and orphan, not because anybody wants them to be orphaned, but because nobody has the information or the access or even the context to be able to figure out even how to clear the rights that are out there. Now, this becomes quite compelling with certain works that were originally produced in a, in a, um, uh, in a fragile medium. So, you know, original film, which was produced on nitrate based stock, um, you know, eventually just dissolves. And so if you wanted to assure the preservation of that in a large scale commercial sense, it would be almost impossible to do that, uh, while respecting the full range of creative rights that are said to apply to, to that creative work. That's just an unintended consequence of the particular system of copyright that we've adopted that benefits nobody, harms culture and people generally, but we can't, but, you know, it's extremely hard to, to get changes in this law because the lobbyists who defend the status quo are so effective and powerful in their defense. Can you talk a little bit about remixes as well? Because I think, I mean, you've argued, I know in the past about the, um, how younger people are particularly impacted by these older era law, laws designed for a different era that are now applying to copyright when it puts that for younger people, so much of their life is online that you have noted that about 70% of the material that they're accessing, they're accessing in what, um, in what is essentially illegal ways and then utilizing in ways that, that are seen as illegal, which criminalizes a very large portion of people under sort of 25, 30, um, especially um, people in their teens still. Could you talk a bit about remixes? Because I think that's a really good example of how this impacts a particular group of people. Yeah, so again, copyright law was not written imagining that there would be people who would take creative work who are not doing it for a commercial purpose and remix it and share it with their friends or other people who might enjoy the remix. Um, you know, it was originally crafted to be a tool to regulate commercial production of creative work. Um, in some traditions, like the you know, continental traditions, it was also increasingly, it was also incredibly importantly protecting basically rights of privacy so that you didn't have works made available that you didn't want to be available and some rights of integrity so that you couldn't be attributed to works that don't really speak for what you believe in. But in the American tradition, it was really always about creating the right sort of incentives to make sure that commercial creativity um, was possible uh, given the 
um, the uncertainties and the high costs of uh, creative work. But when we moved into a world where the technology enabled anybody to take creative work and to do stuff to it, and when we wanted people to take creative work and do stuff to it, when, you know, we kind of like the idea of our kids engaging in creative work by taking and remixing and sharing the remix. Um, the question then became, how does copyright deal with this new type of use? Now, many of us were pushing for what seems a very sensible adjustment, which would basically say if you're making a remix for a non-commercial purpose, copyright law doesn't even touch what you're doing. Um, you know, it's basically a copyright-free zone because there's no reason to be regulating the non-commercial remixing of creative work. Um, but if you're doing it for commercial purposes, then that ought to be taxed because we want to make sure that the creator, the original creator, and even the people whose work's being remixed in a new remix get some um, compensation for the creative work that is being used. But the law was not amenable to that evolving understanding. Um, and so even to this day, you have these extraordinary stories of especially rap artists um, um, uh, who will have their work uh, claim to be taking other people's work. And if it becomes successful, then there are all these sorts of extraordinary lawsuits that come out of the woodwork to regulate and block the ability to take and build upon that type of work, all because we've stayed fixed in the idea that any copying or any remixing or any creativity that builds upon earlier work is going to presumptively need the permission of the earlier creator, which I think makes no sense of our tradition and also stifles a lot of very legitimate and important creativity. That's a good link, I think, maybe to ask you a bit about the creation of the Creative Commons license, um, which has just celebrated its 20th birthday at the um, Creative Commons Summit. Can you explain what it is for anyone who might be unfamiliar with Creative Commons? And was there anything in particular that pushed you towards its creation? Well, many of us recognized that at the, you know, 20 years ago, the world of copyright seemed to be divided between those who insisted that all rights be reserved and those who believed that no rights should be respected. So two extremes in that debate. Um, that, that we didn't believe actually described the view of the vast majority of people who might be touching or using creative work. Um, and we believe that the vast majority of those people were happy to have their work shared and used for some purposes, even if not for all purposes. So we wanted to create a simple way for them to say that. Um, not to say all rights reserved, um, but some rights reserved and some rights given over to the public. And so that was the idea motivating the original licenses. And so what the licenses do is they express the freedoms that creative work is intended to carry. Um, so if I mark my creative work with a CC BY license, what that says is you can use it for whatever purpose you want, even commercial purposes, remix it to whatever you want. You just have to give me permission. You just have to give me um, credit. You have to um, uh, say that it was my work. Um, and that minimal um, you know, acknowledgement uh, um, is the quid pro quo for being able to use the work for whatever purpose you want. And then some people are happy to have people use their work, but not for commercial purposes. So we would say by uh, NC, by um, you have to say whose work it is, but you also can use it so long as freely, so long as you're using it for non-commercial purposes. Um, and so we we offered a range of licenses, originally many more. Now, eventually, they we narrowed it down to just six that gave people this menu of freedoms that they could attach to their work so that others knew how they could build on it and share with it. Um, and this, you know, filled an obvious gap that was out there. I mean, we didn't persuade people they should want to uh, share their work. They wanted to share their work. They just didn't have an easy way to do it. And, and so very quickly, many scientific journals began adopting the Creative Commons licenses because that expressed their ideal about how people should be able to share their creative work. Wikipedia adopted the Creative Commons licenses because they wanted to make sure that Wikipedia is uh, free for people to take and build upon as long as they make what they build uh, available to others. Um, uh, you know, there are many photographers and musicians that began to make their work available because they wanted people to freely be able to build upon it. These are lots of different contexts where people began to see that um, they didn't actually want perfect control. 
what they wanted was some acknowledgement, and that's the requirement of um, um, citing who it is you've gotten the work from. And depending on the work, um, they might want to restrict certain kinds of commercial uses. That idea, which we launched it originally, um, you know, I guess I expected originally it was going to be almost like a thought experiment. We were really astonished with how quickly people began to adopt it. And then we started launching chapters around the world of Creative Commons um, that would localize the licenses to the jurisdictions of the countries. So we had Japan and Korea and France and Germany and um, all across Europe and all across Asia. Um, and and as that happens, that really united a movement uh, of people who were deeply focused on how to assure access to our culture um, and to give creators the simple ability to signal to others what kind of freedom they wanted their creativity to carry. It's really astonishing now how widely it's used as well across, from education through to law, through to the crea creative artists doing artworks to uh, writers uh, in, within the sciences for publishing. It just, it seems to have an extraordinarily wide usage. And I wondered how, how is that ecosystem doing now? And, um, what do you think it does well, and what do you think it could be improved about Creative Commons? Well, I think that it expresses its ideals well. Um, there's a constant challenge to update the expression of those ideals into the into the technological environment of the time. So I've long dreamed of um, enabling a much simpler way to in some sense, watermark or mark the creative work so that there's a really trivial way to get back to an original license. And um, there have been technologists who have, I mean, there's companies that are deploying technologies like this, and we're talking to them about how to roll that into Creative Commons. But the objective to make it so that, you know, there's a very simple way to know exactly what freedoms or what um, restrictions run with content um, I think is a really important technical objective that, um, you know, we could always do better. Then the other thing that I think is, you know, obvious is the, um, in some sense, the problem of the internet today is very different from the problem 20 years ago. 20 years ago, there was a big fight to make sure that there would be free access to, or access to legally uh, authorized content. Um, and give people a way to make it clear the content was legally authorized so that they could share it freely um, and build upon it. And today, of course, when you think about the internet as comprised of, you know, what's in Facebook and what's on Twitter and what's inside of um, any number of uh, major platforms, TikTok and the thing and, and those others, it's clear that within each of those um, uh, silos, there is, um, authority, authorization to use and share content that's built into the terms of service of Facebook or um, of TikTok. Um, but, uh, but there's really um, a puzzle or a question about what you can do with that content outside of those silos. So those rights are written in a way that kind of keeps you in the walled garden of whatever platform you're living in and no easy way to idea understand how to migrate outside of that walled garden. And the other thing that's very striking about today is that, uh, in some sense, many people are resisting the sharing of not copyrighted material, but their own data. Like we live in a world where there's persistent surveillance of everything everybody does. And that persistent surveillance, um, uh, you know, leads to all sorts of marketing engagement that might be destructive to important values. So we've, you know, just this week seen the testimony of Francis Haugen, who was a Facebook whistleblower about architectural decisions Facebook made that had the consequence of making the platform more dangerous for certain people. Um, and that's a product of gathering their data and using their data to maximize the growth and spread and add revenue of Facebook as a platform. This leads people to think maybe we need a way to uh, give people the power to control the use of their data. Just like 20 years ago, we were thinking, how do we give people a way to 
uh, control the access to their copyrighted material. And, um, and so people have thought, started thinking about, is there a Creative Commons-like solution or uh, part of a solution to the problem of privacy or the problem of misusing data like that, that we could have a good reason to try to figure out how to deploy it's a that's a fascinating area as well um with many pro other proposals seeming um not very constructive in dealing with with that issue um and i I'd, I'd love to uh learn more about that as it goes ahead if it hopefully goes ahead um I, you're, you've also talked about NFTs within Creative Commons, which, um, in a in a very positive way, as being very freeing for artists today. And NFTs for many of us, many people will have only come across it in almost a um, belittling way in the press of what are these things. Surely, certainly, that would have been my view initially of these. I was interested to know to to, to read that you take a different view. And I wondered if you might explain why you see them as such a positive um, move for creators and how it fits within the creative commons structure. Well, you know, the first step is to make a leap of faith that people could value things that were in some sense only virtual. Now, you know, if you have teenagers in your house, it's not hard to make that leap of faith because they spend an extraordinary amount of time in virtual environments where they're fighting obsessively for purely things of purely virtual value, whether it's items inside of a game or other things that they might be trading between games. So it's not hard to imagine people do this, but that's the first step you've got to make. And so so if you imagine that people could be valuing things that are purely virtual, uh, purely digital in this sense, um, what the NFT world is demonstrating is that there could be a way to make creative work available that both allows the author, the creator, to profit from that creativity, but simultaneously assures access to that creative work freely. So, for example, let's say you're an artist and you, um, you do a new design for a poster, and with that poster you create, a, an, a, you create an NFT for that poster. What the NFT basically means is that there can be only one copy of that NFT. So it's like the unique original poster. And you can auction that NFT and you can say, you know, how much is somebody willing to pay for the Shepard Fairy poster? And let's say somebody is willing to pay, you know, a substantial amount of money to the author. The author at that point could have a very strong interest to making a digital copy of that image available simultaneously under something like a Creative Commons license so that somebody has the original, but there are plenty of digital copies of that original that are floating around. And people know the difference between the NFT original and the uh, copies that are floating around, just like people know the difference between the Monet, um, you know, a Monet sitting in a museum and, um, and you know, digital copies of the Monet that's flo floating around on the internet. And And so what we're actually talking about is a way to make it so that an artist could release the NFT, license the image under a CC license. The NFT um, could be then sold and resold. And as it's resold, the original artist would get a cut from whatever new sale there was. So this is creating an economy for the artists as a quid pro quo for the artist making the work generally accessible under at least a non-commercial license, but um, as broadly as they're willing. Um, so that the digital copies of that could live independently of the NFT. Some, it's a way to kind of have our cake and eat it too in a context where, you know, originally people thought this was just not going to, the whole problem with the digital world was that there was not going to be a way to distinguish between things of value and things of not. Um, you know, and I think in 10 years, it's going to be obvious there's an easy way to make that distinction. And we should just be thinking about how to build the technology to make that happen. Your first book that was um, immediately influential was 1999's Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace, in which you argued that the internet even then was, um, in your words, changing from a libertarian's utopia to a place that 
that's controlled by commercial interests that could kill the innovative culture that fostered the internet we see today. Which So we're, we're more than 20 years on from that point. You revised the book in 2006 as Code 2.0, but I wonder if you were revising it again for 2021. What might you emphasize now or perhaps reconsider that you focused on in those previous versions? Well, um, hmm. it's been a long time since I've thought about it. I, I think that, um, you know, the missing part to the story, looking back, uh, is the um, the arise of um, what Shoshana Zuboff has talk, described as uh, surveillance capitalism. So the way in which we evolved a technology for um, advertising that traded on gathering as much data about individuals as possible and then turning that data into profiles that could then be used to predict. And um, that has a pretty dramatic effect on the nature of content on the internet. And it's a pretty clear instance of the general point I was making in that book of thinking about the relationship between the technology and the policies that the technology is enabling. You know, my own view about these technologies today is that we've seen extraordinarily important contexts of social life really ravaged by the rise of this manipulation engine, uh, which these technologies are, whether that's, um, you know, the, um, political context, which, you know, obviously has become increasingly radicalized in the United States and in Europe um, as uh, as parties discover that they need to become more Trump-like in order to reach their people. And as they become more Trump-like, they attract more Trump-like candidates. So it's like a vicious cycle of self-destruction for democracy. Um, and it's also, you know, devastating for certain types of individuals who have certain vulnerabilities. So the Wall Street Journal did this wonderful video that demonstrated the way TikTok led people down rabbit holes of content. Um, um, and those those rabbit holes were, were, you know, not necessarily, maybe not even likely, healthy, constructive rabbit holes of content. So you begin to describe an interest in healthy eating, and that immediately brings you to for example, anti-vaxxing um, information by mothers who are against vax vaccinations, or you have body dysphoria and the system feeds you more and more images or videos about body dysphoria, not because it's good for you, but because it makes you engage. And that's what they're focusing on, how to get you to engage. And that dynamic is, of course, socially destructive, even if it's profitable for the platforms that are making it happen. And so, you know, this would be a perfect context to think about this trade-off between market incentives and the architectures that enable those market incentives to work and the policy objectives of whether we want the consequence of that to be um, part of our society or not. Um, I think that's a big area that um, I think still needs a lot of investigation and work. Mm. And I was thinking as well about, you know, your your um, book's remix and then free culture have also really stood the test of time. And but perhaps in a way that's disappointing, you would have hoped we'd have moved on from needing to consider those contexts and arguing for change. Is it is it I don't know, does it get frustrating or is it uh, um, to to not to still need to be making those same arguments. I don't know. Perhaps that's why you've moved on to focusing on other interests as well. Well, I moved on because um, I became convinced, as my friend and former CC founder Aaron Swartz was convinced, that um, uh, if we didn't address the more fundamental problem of corruption of our political system, it didn't really matter what we were arguing for in the context of issues like copyright or even more fundamental issues like you know climate change, that the inability of our government to, to do the right thing, not necessarily the thing I agree with, but a thing that's not driven by 
the interest of funders of campaigns was um, uh, was devastating for a wide range of uh, policy issues. And so, you know, I decided to take up the challenge of trying to figure or support the movement that would push us to a place where we could get the kind of reform that would restore us um, uh, um, some semblance of a representative democracy. That fight, of course, has only gotten more intense and more important. Um, and though on the one hand, we've seen enormous growth and recognition of the problem um, and um, actually very important proposals for reform that have become central um, to uh, at least democratic politics. On the other hand, the increasing polarization, partisan character of American government means that it's very hard to imagine any of this ever becoming law. So it's both the best of times and worst of times, the best of times because we actually have a huge movement of people who support it, but the worst of times because the very problem we're trying to address means it's almost impossible to address it. That, that's what led me to move on. Um, and, you know, I always thought if we could just fix that problem, I'd be happy to come back and then work more on what should happen in the culture space. But um, unfortunately, we haven't fixed that problem yet. We need to get to work on that then because we need you back in the culture space <laughs> as well. Um, and, I, and, and perhaps what you've done, I, I want to come back to ask you a little more about um, Aaron and his and his legacy too, as you see it. But the uh, um, but you you're no stranger to some significant court cases. And I actually first came across you, your name because of your appointment um, as a special master to the Microsoft antitrust case, which now seems ancient. Um, but the the antitrust case that was brought by the U.S. Department of Justice um, and. The, then as a young lawyer, you clerked for Supreme Court Justice Anton Scalia, which is a, a, a quite interesting, I think, too, um, a quite conservative justice where you already, your politics were already changing, as I understand, at that point. And then you ended up in the Supreme Court yourself with the Eldred versus Ashcroft case in 2003, which was a major challenge to the U.S. Congress's vote to further extend the term of copyright to the lifetime of the creator plus 70 years at that point. And Justice Ginsburg delivered the court's majority opinion, finding against the case. Um, I know you've since argued that it's impossible to go back to the, for the courts or legislature to get copyright laws changed because you've said the courts are too passive and legislature too slow, which I think is connects as well to your, just what you've been discussing in terms of the underlying problems that need changing. And I wonder, do you, do you still feel that way about the, the courts and the issue of copyright and, and the legislature and copyright, or in hindsight, would you have argued the case in a different way? Or are there new ways to go to court and um, challenge some of these issues since we're nearly 20 years beyond that case? Well, I think that, you know, there's an important lesson about how you can win by losing. Um, and there are many people who reached out including some lobbyists from the copyright industry, when the copyright extension that we were challenging, the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act from 1998, was um, expiring. And um, what they said was, you may have lost the battle, but you, you won the war because we didn't see copyright um, uh, owners rallying Congress to extend the term of copyright again. Um, and I think the reason that didn't happen is that people realized, they realized that there would be huge outrage, uh, uproar if they tried to do it again. And, and that's because, you know, our case and the work of many different activists across the spectrum had raised the awareness in many people's minds of how this was just a grab of power and profits by a relatively small number of corporate corporations. And it wasn't anything to do with improving the lives of creators or assuring better access to our culture. So I think that, um, uh, you know, we count that as a, a victory, even though the case expresses it as a loss. Um, and I, I, I think that, um, you know, it's an important lesson. You've got to be willing to take on cases or take on fights that you are confident you're not going to win, but only because it begins to push 
understanding or culture in the direction of what you know is true or right. Um, uh, now, you know, I, I've spent way too much of my life, actually, with every case I've ever argued, <laughs> thinking about how I could have done it differently. Um, and I kind of feel it as a mark of health that I don't think I've done that with the Eldred case, Eldred case in many years. But, um, um, you know, there's always ways in which one imagines you could have done it differently. I remember, though, at the time, um, a mentor of mine who was one of the most influential judges in America, Judge Richard Posner, you know, said to me, y you can't expect that you're going to win this case. There's just no way to win this case because, you know, it's an idea against all the money in the world. And, um, you know, that's not a formula for victory. And maybe that's true. Um, uh, but I, you know, I, I do believe that um, the position we were advancing is not only correct, but would have made the world a better place. And um, we basically got there, but it took 20 years to get there. It, this, I know you've taken, um, made a similar point about your, um, you're putting yourself forward for the presidential race in 2016 as well, that this was a, um, you, you were not entirely confident that you would end up winning the Democratic nomination and going on to being our president, perhaps, but you were able to raise some significant issues of import, although I would have loved to have seen President Lessig in place, right? <laughs> <Isn't that? laughs> Instead of Donald Trump for the, those four years. Yeah, I mean, um, when I tried to become a candidate, it was because I thought the Democratic Party needed to make reform fundamental to their platform. And that's because I felt that there were many people on both the right and the left who were so disgusted with their perception of the corruption inside of our government that they would not support at least the Democratic ticket unless they believed it was committed to um, rooting out that type of corruption. And, you know, um, when uh, when I launched my campaign, um, I said I would run f formally if I could raise, ironically, a large amount of money in a short period of time. And when I did that and I launched my campaign, um, the challenge was to get into the debates. We had estimated based on polling that I would qualify for the debate. And when I did, you know, when I was on the cusp of qualifying for the second debate in October, um, uh, the Democratic Party basically informed us that they would never allow me to be in the debates and they changed the rules and made it so I couldn't participate. So it was clear I couldn't continue a campaign when I knew that there was no chance to even show up in the debates. But again, I feel like... Um, Four years later, the platform that I was pushing essentially became the platform that practically every single major Democratic candidate endorsed, not because it was my platform. And I'm not taking credit for that. It's the work of many, many activists who were pushing this reform. But, you know, when I ran in 2015, I said we had to end the suppression of the vote. We had to end gerrymandering. We had to change the way campaigns were funded. And every single candidate, every major candidate for president in 2020 on the Democratic ticket endorsed a package called H.R. 1, where the first point was ending the suppression of the vote. The second was ending gerrymandering. The third was changing the way campaigns were funding, funded. And then there was a bunch of other changes as well. So it was better than what I was originally arguing for. And to see that again was re re reaffirming because um, to make clear again, I'm not saying it's because of the, my work, but it was signaling that the work that I was part of um, had made progress. And, I, and again, indeed, I think that right now, many people are convinced of the urgent need to address this, and Democrats even more so, because as they watched Joe Biden's agenda stall uh, because of the extraordinary influence of lawyers, uh, of lobbyists inside of our political system, many are reminded of the point that we had been making for many, many years, which is, you got to fix democracy first. If you don't fix democracy, then nothing else matters. Let's maybe come back to Aaron, a person you were very close to and worked alongside, phenomenally gifted internet activist and young coder. Um, as you noted so movingly in the in your speech at the Creative Commons Summit, he lost his own life fighting for internet internet and copyright reform, something that that um, we should all keep in mind. He was 
really bullied into a suicide by a U.S. state and a federal legislative system which wanted to make an example of him and his um, quite symbolic breaches of copyright, which arguably, arguably were not doing any significant harm, but had a very potent um, symbolic value in, in this battle to widen out copyright and to not wall in culture, something he felt so strongly about. And he started the Guerrilla Open Access Manifesto movement because he opposed the restriction of academic articles to an elite at U.S. universities. And he has gone on to inspire so many others to activism. And I wonder, are there any people now in, that you feel are carrying forward that torch that he lit? And I'm thinking of maybe younger people like Alexandra um, El uh, the with Science Hub, which copies and then disseminates academic science articles, but is accused of piracy by science publishers, which to me seems to fit very much in that what what Aaron was trying to express as well. Yeah, I mean the tragedy of Aaron's um, uh, demise here um, is that uh, you know the work which eventually brought him down was not actually the most important thing he was working on at the time. Um, you know, he, like many of us had many projects going and, and he was so, um, driven by the view that, um, scientific work should be available for free globally, not just to elite universities in America that he, you know, almost as a side uh, project took this up to, copy the JSTOR archive, and then we don't know for sure what, but um, presumably make it accessible, at least in the context of the developing world. And that's, of course, what Science Hub has done. Um, so to the extent Aaron was fighting for this, Science Hub is basically producing it and producing it outside of, you know, in a jurisdictional context where it's going to, it's very hard to, to do anything about it. Um, you know, I think that, uh, What's, what's important about that story is to recognize he was not opposing the idea of copyright in general. He was opposing it being deployed against the interest of both the public and the authors. You know, there are very few scientists who are eager to have their work hidden behind a paywall and very few who spent the time to even understand how their work would be captured and controlled because of, uh, you know, scientific journals um, being sold off to conglomerates or whatever else the reason is to block access to their work. So this is, this was not um, an opposition to copyright. It was an opposition to dumb copyright. And, and, you know, it became a cause which he took up. Um, and then um, I think really the, prospect of losing his freedom, whether it's his economic freedom, which fighting the case would have cost him, or his um, physical freedom, which losing the case would have cost him, just in the end became too much for him to bear, and we lost him. And if you were, um, if you're looking at the state of copyright today, compared with when you first started out battling to improve it, where do you think we are? Um, are things better? Are things worse? I think in some ways it's better and in some ways it's worse. Um, it's better because there have been a larger number of courts that have recognized thicker fair use rights. Um, it was a very important decision to uphold the um, Google Book Search project and um, you know, there have been other important places where transformative work has been recognized as free of the restrictions of copyright. Not universally. There have been some pretty bad decisions, but um, not as frequently as there were before. Um, and better because, you know, work is entering the public domain again for the first time in many, many years. We every year can celebrate new work that's entering the public domain. Um, the Center for the Public Domain at Duke Law School has a wonderful collection every year as the works pass into the public domain of what the culture has now um, has now gotten back, and uh, you know, there's been plenty of work demonstrating that when that work enters the public domain, it's all of a sudden accessible at a at a cheap and uh, 
at an affordable price for many, many people because there are many people who are now able to produce it and share it, whereas before it was locked up in a way that was typically not even exploited. So I think all of those are are good changes. I I still don't though don't think that we have a system of sensible policymaking here or anywhere. Um, and I still think that, you know, the strongest interests um, have the capacity to uh, um, defeat um, changes that are plainly in the public good. And, and so that's the reason to say that this, the fight that I left the field of copyright to take up is still a fight that um, um, we should be undertaking. You know, and we're going to see, obviously, um, one of my heroes in this movement um, um, is Brewster Kahle, uh, and Brewster's uh, Internet Archive is under significant threat from legal, from litigation, um, that I imagine, I think this this fall is actually proceeding, but um, that will be an important test because, uh, you know, obviously my view of the archive is that it, it fills an extraordinarily important hole in the basic ecology of the information of the internet to make sure that we have access to our past and can preserve and, and sustain access to culture that um, is typically not commercially available and um, and to substitute and to create a kind of digital version of libraries that makes it so that we can have access to printed works, not printed, but you know at least fairly the way you would if you went to a library. All of these functions of um, of Brewster's archive have been in, have become incredibly important parts of the internet. And if the courts shut them down. Um, and even worse, you know, punish Brewster significantly for them, then I think we will have suffered an enormous loss. But, but um, you know, all, all fingers are crossed to see that maybe something sensible will happen here. And maybe finally, what would you recommend others do to improve copyright, the copyright situation and access to knowledge? Well, I think that there's still an enormous amount of activism that's possible here. You know, for example, kids in uh, universities um, should be pressing the question to academics about why their work is not freely available. Um, you know, most academics don't even think about it. They don't even bother with the question. They publish an article, who cares where it's published? Because, of course, they can have access to it since they live inside of, you know, the privileged digital walls of um, universal access. But there ought to be a question, like why, why when you publish, don't you publish in a way that guarantees other people will have access to the work, whether they happen to live in the United States or in Rwanda? Um, so I think that's one important area. And the other important area is really the opposite side of this, to be respectful of the rights, especially the rights of those who have um, given away some of their rights. You know, So if somebody makes their work available for non-commercial purposes, you should cite them, but also make sure those restrictions are restrictions you respect. Because we need to encourage, I think, a recognition among artists as well as um, the public uh, about the um, about the compatibility with this free licensing and um, uh, and the creative uh, work of artists, rather than viewing it as inconsistent. Um, and so I think those are two places where people can constantly think and work, and that would be enormously helpful if they did. Lawrence Lessig, thank you so much for talking to us um, on Wild Culture today. For anyone who wants to learn more about what we've discussed today, a good place to start is Larry Lessig's website at www.lessig.org, which has his writings and commentary, videos, interviews, a bibliography, um, and much more about both the, his interests in the past and his interests now. And for our listeners and viewers, thank you so much for joining us today. For now, it's goodbye from me, Carla Nellington, and the Wald Culture Podcast. And we hope you'll join us for further episodes ahead as we explore the spaces where technology, culture, and copyright collide. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.